Hi, this is Mike. Thank you for being a part of what God's doing at the Heights Fellowship. We hope you enjoy this message. We know it's not the same thing as being here in person, but we pray that God would move as you listen and as God applies this to your heart. Just to remind you of what we talked about last week, we really, we really focused a lot on our emotional discipleship. You know, we talked about those four things in white there, the physical, the spiritual, the intellectual, and the social being something that we, we major on as followers of Christ. And in the church, especially the Western church, we talk about those things a lot. Okay, but, the, but the, our emotions as part of our becoming like Christ, we, we don't always give a lot of emphasis to. And so we're going to continue that, but, but much more practical this week in talking about that and how we continue on this journey of becoming and looking like Christ in our world here in Lubbock, Texas. And if you're not from Lubbock, Texas, in your world where you live and what that looks like. You know, last week I introduced to you these three simple bullet points, but we're going to major on these this morning. This is where we're going to kind of camp and work our way through these by looking at three different examples in Scripture of each one of these. Okay, so you can focus on, it's going to be a very familiar story with each one, but you're going to be able to relate and go, that's part of my story too. Be with Jesus, become like him, and then do as he did. Very simple, okay? Very simple, but that's each of our goals of being, the word I introduced to you last week is being an, an apprentice of Jesus. You know, we understand and we use the word often disciple, and maybe we understand what that means at, at a deep level, but I think we all get what it means to be an apprentice. We become like our master. And so that's where we're going this morning. And being before you do, here's the definition for that. A person who practices being before doing operates from a place of emotional and spiritual fullness, deeply aware of themselves, others, and God. As a result, their being with God is sufficient to sustain their doing for God. Remember last week as I set the foundation from, from the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus talks about, before he starts teaching them, he talks about doing these things, being the light. And then he finishes that teaching by saying, practice these things, do these things. So we, we see that practicing what we've heard what we know to be true as being part of what we should be doing as disciples of Christ. And let's, let's define those two phrases a little bit so you understand when you see those, what, what those mean. Emotional fullness is manifested or made real primarily by a high level of awareness of our feelings, our weaknesses and limits, how their past or how our past can impact our present and then how others experience them. See, that all falls into who we are. And then spiritual fullness reveals itself in a healthy balance between our being with God and our doing for God. So there's a healthy balance between that. We've got to, yes, we're spiritual beings, but yes, we're fully emotional beings too at the same time, as we talked about last week. So let's jump right in. Being with Jesus versus doing for Jesus. If you have your Bibles or your devices that you follow along in Scripture, or you can just follow along on the screen, it's all there. Luke 10, 38 through 42 is a very familiar story, but let's look at it from the perspective of being with Jesus. Now, as they were traveling along, he, being Jesus, entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister called Mary who was seated at the Lord's feet, listening to his word. Okay? Picture that. Two sisters. Jesus is coming to their house. They're friends already. Martha welcomes Jesus in. Mary is seated and listening. But Martha was distracted. Any of you distracted? Even when you're trying to be with Jesus, that you're distracted? I am. 
even though I'm intentional about being with Jesus, I'm still distracted. Martha experienced that. She was distracted with all her preparations. And she came up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone? Then tell her to help me. You know, there's <laughs> Martha. I know a lot of Marthas. You may be a Martha. That everything has to be just right. Everything has to be perfect. And you want everybody to be a part of your unrealistic perfection. Okay? You want to draw everybody in. Martha was distracted. Verse 41 goes on to say, But the Lord answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and bothered about so many things, but only one thing is necessary, for Mary has chosen the good part, which shall not be taken away from her. Okay, you have two sisters. Jesus is with them. He's in their house. Martha's distracted. Jesus is sitting and talking, teaching, sharing, having conversation. Doesn't tell us exactly what he's talking about. But what I see in this example is that Mary choosing to be in Jesus' presence and be with him. Not worrying about how the dinner's going. Not worried about the place settings are right. Not worrying about if every little thing is picked up. But being in Jesus' presence and sitting at his feet. That's important for us to absorb here. To understand how important that is. To be with him. We can't be like, we can't become him. And we can't do what he tells us until we be with him. Jesus told Martha, Mary has chosen the good part. Are you choosing the best part by sitting and listening? There's your question. First one for consideration today. Are you choosing the best part? Are you not being distracted? Are you not being worried? Are you not being burdened? with all the stuff of life, and you, you allow yourself to sit at Jesus' feet. Four ways to be with God before doing for God. These are just some things for you to think about. Number one, make a radical decision. There's, there's your start to being with Jesus. The radical decision is to end our addiction, not to drugs or alcohol, but to tasks and doing. Make a radical decision. For some of you, that's going to be hard. You like doing. That's your identity. I do, 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 do. I get stuff done. It's going to be hard. That's where you start. Number two, we talked about last week, sit in your feelings. Feel them. Are you angry? Are you disappointed? Are you afraid? What, what, what? Are you anxious? Depressed? You know, what feeling do you have? Feel it. Allow yourself to feel it. Sit in it. Number three, integrate silence. Integrating silence and stillness utterly transforms the way we follow Jesus and the way we lead. Integrate silence. I've started doing this in my own life. Five minutes was an eternity when I began. I'm up to ten now. Just sitting in silence, letting God speak to me. You know, I added simplicity, solitude, and surrender in there too as you sit in silence because I think those other three S words are important as we sit in that. We find out we, we need to do those things too. Simplify our life. That takes away some of the distractions. You know, get alone. We see Jesus doing that all the time. On a regular basis, he leaves the crowd and he goes and sits with his father, often. Our approach to prayer 
changes from focusing on getting God to do what we want to positioning ourselves so that we want what God wants. Being silent in God's presence is prayer. If we stay with silence, be it for two minutes, five minutes, 20 minutes, or more each day, it revolutionizes our relationship with God in Christ. And I challenge you with that. Tomorrow, in your quiet time, turn off the worship music, close your Bible, and just sit alone in silence and listen to what God has for you. One of the ladies in my life group said, oh, Randy, I tried that because I shared this with them a little earlier. She said, I tried that and, and it took me 10 minutes to, to get through all my distractions. Yeah, I get it. But, but persist. Keep sitting in that and listening to him just like Mary did. And the last one, number four, commune with Jesus throughout the day. It's not just a one-time thing you do in the morning to get your day. That's a good start. It's what we should do. It says, when you realize that the goal of the Christian life is to abide, that's from John 15, okay, and we understand that being connected to him when we read that passage in John 15, in Jesus all day, remaining in communion with him and everything, everything changes. So you start with that time, maybe of quietness, because most of our days aren't quiet. It's hard to find a, a time just to be quiet the rest of the day. In the mornings, that's why I think Jesus did that. He got up early in the morning and went away to his spot, to his solitude, to sit in his silence before God. But we can do that throughout the day. Paul in Thessalonians said, pray without ceasing. That's how you accomplish that. See, I can listen to the Holy Spirit throughout the day. You know, I don't have to stop what I'm doing to listen. But that time of silence, that time of alone with Jesus jump starts that ability to do that throughout the day, not just a one-time event. And here's the doer's checklist. If you're a doer and you just go, 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 see if you see yourself in any of these bullet points. I know I'm, my doing exceeds my being when... I can't shake the pressure I feel from having too much to do in too little time. If you're a mom, if you're a dad, if you're a grandparent, if you're a child, our, our lives are busy and we're constantly thinking, I gotta do this, I gotta get it done. I am ignoring the stress, anxiety, and tightness of my body. See, it goes back to those first five things that we all are all the time. It's physical. It even if it starts affecting our, our physical being. I know people that they've been so anxious they got physically sick because their emotions began controlling even their body. I am concerned with what others think. I know that's none of you, but that, that hits me. I am often fearful about the future. You saw me list that on well, my list of things last week, my own journey. It's real. I am often fearful about the future, but I'm always rushing. I'm defensive and easily offended. I'm preoccupied and distracted. I fire, fire off opinions and judgments. Sure glad we have Facebook so we can do that. I feel unenthusiastic about or threatened by the success of others. And I spend more time talking than listening. Becoming like Jesus, the next step, the next goal of being his disciple or his apprentice from John 21, we're going to look at Peter now. We looked at Mary and Martha. Now Peter's going to be our focal point. So when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, this is at the end of John. Jesus is resurrected and come back. 
We know, what, would, what do we know about Peter? He was the leader of the 12. He denied he even knew Jesus three times. He's struggling. He's wanting to go back to fishing. This being an apprentice of Jesus, this being a disciple is maybe not what I'm called out for. It's what Peter's thinking as he's sitting on that beach and then he encounters Jesus again. Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon of John, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, shepherd my lambs. And he said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved now because he said it to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were younger, Peter, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will gird you and bring you where you do not wish to go. Now this he said, signifying by what kind of death that he, Peter, would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him simply, just follow me. Follow me. Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved, which was John, who was following them. The one who also had leaned back on his bosom at the supper and said, Lord, who, who is the one who betrays you? So Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? What about, what about this guy? Jesus' response to Peter, if I want to remain until, if I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. And what he's saying in that, what, what is going on in this interaction between Jesus and Peter is that Peter's down. Peter's ready to quit. Jesus gives him an opportunity in their interaction to overcome those three denials and let Peter say out loud, Lord, I love you. I deny you. I don't know this man. I don't know this man. I don't know this man. Jesus gave him the opportunity to say, I love you. I love you. I love you. But then he tells him twice, don't worry about what John's doing. Don't worry about anything else. You follow me. Now, was this the first time Peter had ever heard that? Mm -mm. When Jesus walks up on the shore for the very first time, and James and John and Peter and Andrew are working their boats, he walks up to him and says, follow me. And what he's saying when he says that to them and to us is become like me, follow me, listen to what I say, watch what I do. Absorb what I'm going to teach you. See, and it hasn't changed. That calling in Peter's life has not changed. Just follow me. You don't, you don't have to become a better Peter. Yeah, you messed up. You denied me. You don't have to become a better Peter. Follow me. Become like me. Jesus told Peter simply, you follow me. Don't worry about the other stuff. Don't be distracted by all the things you've done wrong. By the fear of the future, what's this look like without me? Just follow me. Become like me. So here's some questions for you to consider. Who or what are you being formed into? For Peter, it ceased being a fisherman. It became becoming like Jesus. Who, who are you becoming? Are you becoming a model of who Jesus was? Are you looking like Jesus? 
Are you becoming more loving? Remember the last step, the last stage of those stages of discipleship we talked about last week? What was it? We, we begin loving. That becomes our nature. We don't have to think about, do I love that person, no matter the circumstances or situation? But that's what most makes you look like Jesus. He told his disciples that. They'll know that you're my disciple by the way you love each other. That's what he said. So here's some losing strategies to become like Jesus. Willpower. Dad, gum it, I'm, I can do it. I can be better. I'll just try harder. How's that going for you? No, that's really never worked for me. Because at some point, I try harder and harder and harder to be better and better and better, and then I mess up again. And I go back to sitting on the shore like Peter, licking my wounds, saying, why, why can't I be better? It's not about being better. So our willpower doesn't do it alone. There's nothing wrong with willpower. It's a good thing. But we can't depend on that. Number two, more spiritual and biblical information. If I just keep coming to church and Bible studies, I'll become a really smart follower of Christ. But that doesn't make you become like him either. It gives you more knowledge. You have more to work with. Just follow me. Just follow me. And for some of us, we don't want to do all those first two things anyway. God just zapped me. Boom. Fix me. You know, I've been trying for a long time, and I know it's going to happen. You're just going to zap me, and I'm going to be what I want to be. I'm going to look like Jesus. It's not going to happen probably. Even if he does zap you, some of us need zapping. But there's still the instruction that he gave Peter that he gives us. You just follow me. So here we are to the third one. Doing as Jesus did versus doing what we do. This is Paul writing to the church at Corinth. Not seeking my own profit, but the profit of the many, so that they may be saved, be imitators of me, just as I also am of Christ. Okay. Now, when you read that in Corinthians, it's almost an arrogant statement if you just read over it. Paul going, watch me? Come on, Paul. But how does Paul say that? Im be imitators of me, just as I also am of Christ. Paul to the people that he ministered to each and every day, the people he taught, the churches he planted, he looked like Christ to them. He did what Christ did. Was he perfect? No. If you, if, if you read Paul's letters, we find that out. He's not perfect. He struggles with that. His flesh and his spirit constantly at battle. But because Paul was doing what Christ did, he was worth imitating. And so don't, don't read that as a statement of arrogance on Paul's part. Each one of us, all of you, all of you as a follower of Christ should be able to say that. There should be people in your life that you can look at and say, be, be an imitator of me. Not because I'm good, not because I'm better, but because I'm imitating Christ. That's why we ought to be able to say that. And he goes on to say in Philippians, brethren, join in following my example. Same statement, different group of believers. Follow my example. You know, and, and as we have people who we're discipling, who are following us as an apprentice of Jesus, we should be able to say that. We should be living our life. We should be being with Jesus, becoming more like him and doing the things he does so that other people can imitate us. We all should be able to say that. Henry Blackaby, from his book many years ago, still rings, rings true. When you see the Father at work around you, that is your invitation to adjust your life to him and join him in that work. 
you know, when we see Jesus working in the lives of others, be a part of that. I mean, we, we have many of you looking across the crowd, seeing faces. There are many times that a lot of you have seen God working and you stepped into a ministry and helped with that. God's working over there. I want to be a part of that. Why? That's what Jesus would do. What did he do for three years? He walked along the roads of Palestine, Israel, and each and every stop, he began working. People saw that. He just kept moving through his life. You know, it wasn't a special event. He just kept working the lives of people, and people saw that, and they joined him in that. John Mark Comer, in his book, Practicing the Way, says this. The way we turn our work, literally our work, what you do, from marking time, I'm just getting through my work, you know, I'm just getting through this job, into ministry isn't by becoming a pastor or starting a nonprofit, okay? It's not the way you do it. He may call some of you to that. You know, I never wanted to be a pastor. And there are many days I still don't. Okay? You don't have to make an impact in the lives of others by working at the church or some kind of Christian nonprofit. It's by doing whatever we do the way we imagine Jesus would do it if he were us. With skill, diligence, integrity, humility, with the kingdom's ethics, and so on. It's also by doing our work, work, work very well. You know, I, I had a conversation the last few, few weeks with a, a, a lady uh, in her 40s, and she was struggling at work. And when I told her, I said, you'd be the best employee you can be, period. You just keep being the best employee you can be. And you trust God with whatever the future looks like. But see, that, that's ultimately what John Mark is saying right here. As a follower of Christ, for us to do what Christ does, even in our workplace, because we spend a lot more time there than we do here. I mean, that's where life is lived for us, in our, in our homes, in our workplaces. That's where you're going to look like Jesus on a daily basis, where you have the opportunity to imitate him and have others imitate you. Remember from the 90s? Y'all remember that? WWJD? What would Jesus do? It's a fine question, but a much better question is this. W-W-J-D-I-H-W-M. It's a lot harder to memorize. Doesn't roll off the tongue. But here's the question. What would Jesus do if he were me? If he worked at my job, if he lived at my house, if he had my circumstances, what would Jesus do if he were me? Because see, all of us have different circumstances. <laughs> we heard Jim's story, his journey. Mine's not like that at all. So I live in a different context than you guys at some level. But see, my question should be, what would Jesus do if he were me? If he's living in my circumstances, my hurts, my challenges, my emotions, my physical ailments. What would he do if he were me? Because Jesus isn't us. Jesus was God. I can't always answer the question very good, what would Jesus do? I, I can know the information. I can be with him to get to know him. I can make, be making decisions to become more like him. But what would he do in this circumstance? As I shared with you my, my grief experience last week, there's a lot of place, places in Scripture I can go to, but even in Scripture, I don't see me all the time. But I always can see who Jesus is. And I can become like him. 
and begin doing the things he did. Jesus told Paul, bear my name to the Gentiles. That was Paul's goal. Paul, you go do that. For all of us, that's part of our challenge too. We live in a world of people who don't know Christ, are struggling in their relationship with Christ. And Paul told us, inspired by the Holy Spirit, to imitate me because I imitate Christ. So, are you doing what Jesus would do if he were living your life? There's your question to consider. Rule of life. Here's how you can make this happen. A rule of life is a schedule and a set of practices. There's that word again. We're going to end with it after two weeks. We started with it. We're going to end with it. A rule of life is a schedule and a set of practices and relational rhythms that create space for us to be with Jesus, become like him, and do as he did as we live in alignment with our deepest desires. It's a way of intentionally organizing our lives around what matters most. God. You may need to make some adjustments to be with him. You may need to make some changes in your life to become like him. You may need to have a different perspective on what it looks like to do as Jesus did. You may have to create your own rule of life to accomplish that. If you have ears to hear, let's pray. God, thank you so much again for the opportunity to, to be here with this group of believers this morning and, and um, to give them some insight, some strategy perhaps, some, some challenge, some encouragement in their own journey with you because it is critical. That, that title of these two messages we've looked at the last two weeks is, is, is accurate. It is a critical journey because, God, we, we want to create the rhythms and the schedule in our life that we can, we can major on being with you and thus getting to know you and becoming like you and then ultimately do the things you did in our own circumstances. God, we thank you for giving us this truth from Scripture that we can use as foundation that we can come back to and we can come back to. And I pray, God, that you make each one of us somebody who can say like Paul, be an imitator of me. And I pray that you put into our lives somebody that we can look at and observe like Paul. That we can say, hey, I want to be like him or her because they're following after Christ and they're doing what Christ did. God, I, I too join Chris and I just want to pray for our team that's leaving in the morning to go to Fort Worth. Just bless them, use them. They're going to get to experience all of these goals. They're going to get a chance to be with him. They're going to get a chance to become like him with opportunities. And they're going to get to do what he did to people they don't even know yet. So God, use them in a mighty way to impact the people that cross their paths in Fort Worth. It's your name we pray. Amen. Well, thank you for being a part of what God's doing here at the Heights Fellowship. If the Lord led you to make a decision or you have a question or a need, we want to hear from you. Send us an email at the email listed below, info at theheightsfellowship.org. And we will join you in praying as you take a step forward on your journey with God.